Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Airspace Conference and Trade Show, number one gathering of U.S. Navy and international leaders here uh, outside Washington, D.C. to talk about strategy programs, uh, policy, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by GE Marine, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. And we're here on the Northrop Grumman uh, stand to talk to Curtis Pearson, who is uh, the Director of Strategic Programs at Northrop Grumman Mission Systems. Uh, sir, it's always a pleasure uh, seeing you. You're a longtime Northrop Grumman veteran, and pretty much every program you work on is an interesting program. Uh, that's true. We've had a lot of great opportunities over the years. Uh, exactly, and it's been a couple of years since we saw each other uh, at, a, at, a, at a dinner. So talk to us um, a little bit. Uh, EA6, uh, uh, the EA, excuse me, we were doing a lot of EA6B coverage, obviously the Prowler going out of service, another great Northrop Grumman product. Uh, but the EA18G, the Growler, is uh, obviously the, the mainstay aircraft for the U.S. Navy in terms of uh, fleet jamming, and obviously we'll have an expeditionary role uh, as well. Every All eyes are on the F-35 picking up some of that mission, but I'm Obviously, this is going to be a core airplane for the future. Talk to us about the low band jammer, because everybody has talked about airborne standoff jammer, and that's in the mid range uh, uh, of the game. But now the low band has become something that is a priority for the Navy. Talk to us a little bit about why, uh, in as much as you can, classification allowing becomes such a priority. Right. So the next generation jammer program is really broken into three different pieces mid band, which is currently ongoing. Uh, low band and then high band, broken down by frequency range and essentially the frequency range of the threats. Now, the, the low band program uh, covers a very wide diversity of threats and capabilities because it works both on communications, uh, cyber, as well as low frequency radars. And really what has happened recently is the threats that, that are covered by the low band spectrum um, have moved along very quickly and are being fielded and so it's created a significant sense of urgency on the part of the Navy to get that capability in the fleet. So much so that we're currently working under a, uh, under a demonstration of existing technology program where we are going to be testing um, at the Navy's uh, farm facility um, the majority of the system on the, uh, on the aircraft at, their, uh, at the farm uh, early next year as part of that debt program. And then the Navy's looking to do a rapid acquisition, for which they'll be doing proposals later this year, uh, for, for getting that capability actually out into the fleet by the end of fiscal 2024. So they're pushing very hard to move very fast, and that's really requiring a very tightly integrated government industry team uh, to be able to move forward in a very uh, kind of open, collaborative way. And the, the low band system is, kind of, is unique not only in, its, in that frequency range, but also in its position on the aircraft. It's, it's at what we call station six, at the center line of the aircraft. So it actually sits down just below the fuselage. So it has, so it has a full 360 degree field of view, full 360 degree coverage, and can address threats in that, in that full range. So its positioning on there is, uh, is, is very important, uh, both to that mission. So the other piece that's that's um, that's really important about this is getting is getting the you know things like the weight, the power, and the and particularly the, the drag component of the system, how it's designed, how it integrates into the aircraft, to minimize the effect that 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 the system has on the flight dynamics of the aircraft, the, uh, the combat radius, so that it can do that mission and do that mission when it needs to do that. And uh, obviously one of the challenges is uh, the pylon angling issue um, on the growler, so that actually addresses it by having it on, a, on the center line. Correct, yes, it's on the center line, so it gets full coverage you know, from uh, across the, uh, the fold envelope. And, and let me ask you about sort of speed of procurement, and I'm trying to ask as many of the executives here on it. Um, obviously the Navy, Hondo Gertz, the Navy acquisition executive, but also the leadership has talked about the importance of going very fast. A whole series of programs the Navy is trying to apply that to. Talk to us about how the relationship has changed. You've been on programs that sadly folks wanted to move fast on but ended up moving maybe a little bit less fast than everybody wanted to. Give us, give us some examples about how you guys are moving in an integrated fashion but also moving very quickly because at the end of the day you want to develop the technology but then also field it quickly which means also being able to produce quickly as well. Talk to us about how the whole ecosystem is changing. Absolutely. And I would say probably the biggest thing that, is, that has changed is one, they have, uh, they have designated this program uh, a mid-tier acquisition program, so that opens up some flexibility into how they run the program for the, for the Navy. Um, 
but really, I, I would say the biggest thing and, the, and the, 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 the biggest piece of this that helps us move along that quickly uh, to get to their 2024 goal at the end of the day is really working as an integrated team. Um, you know, we have, with the Navy on the current program, we have one set of meetings. We all sit in the same meetings, we hear the same things, the, you know, the engineers on both sides are working hand in glove uh, in a very open and collaborative relationship so that the Navy doesn't have to guess where we are and we don't have to guess where they want to go. Uh, and I think that, that collaborative relationship is probably the biggest, the, the number one thing I would say in, in allowing us to be able to move very quickly. And uh, we are looking uh, at a renaissance in uh, electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic uh, warfare. Um, obviously, it's a key priority. It's something that uh, strategic adversaries are focusing a lot of time and attention on. Um, do you feel that sort of accelerated sense and pace of urgency to try to develop some of these systems, um, given uh, the kind of environment that everybody's going to be operating in? Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things to say that's, that's unique about the low band and that it covers that area of communications and cyber as well as the low, low band frequency range, but also that, or the low band, uh, low frequency radars, um, is that this is really pushing, you know, something we've been pushing at, at Northrop Grumman for, for quite a while, which is that, um, which is kind of the hardware enabled, software defined, where we have, you know, broader frequency ranges of our systems, uh, more open architecture for the, for the processing, more flexibility in that, so that when we deploy a piece of hardware, it can, can continue to keep pace with the threats through software updates, through changing techniques and new capabilities, and we can, we can keep pace with what, the, uh, with what the threat advancement is doing at the same time, without having to create a whole new system, a whole new set of hardware. Curtis Pearson, the Director of Strategic Programs at Northrop Grumman uh, Mission Systems. Uh, Curtis, always a pleasure. Thanks very, very much, and best of luck on the program. Thank you.